uh, for the presentation and thank you for inviting me to come and have the opportunity to give this talk. Um, it's called Infants Under Double Attack, Gut Microbiota and Environmental Toxicants. I'm going to talk about gut microbiota in the first part of my talk, uh, the largest part, and then I'm going to talk about persistent environmental toxicants in the last part, a bit smaller. And for both these topics, I'm going to give some background. I'm going to talk, you, talk about my studies and give you some results on both topics. And then I'll end up with some take-home messages because it's a lot to process. How many of you feel that you're sort of up to date when it comes to environmental toxicants? Okay, yeah. And how many on gut microbiota? Okay, good. Uh, so I want to give you this as a sort of a teaser to set the scene um, about testicular cancer. As you can see, the incidence is increasing all over Europe. And um, it has been so for a very long period, the last 60 years. You can see on the top is Norway and Denmark, but there's an increase in all the countries that have registries. And I'm not going to talk about testicular cancer. The only reason why I chose that is that for all the other diseases that are also increasing, like autism, HD, asthma, food allergy, there's always this discussion, well, is it just a shift in diagnosis? For testicular cancer, we know the diagnosis is correct. The registers are good. So we don't need to have that discussion. And the point is that um, there probably is part, part, uh, partly uh, an explanation on the diagnostic shift for autism, for instance, and asthma. But there is also a very real increase in diseases among young children. And um, this increase happens even in countries like Norway, which have very little socioeconomic disparity, enough food, clean air, and water. So it's a real puzzle. Why are children getting sick? And that's my motivation for being here. And I hope that is also the motivation that many of you feel, because of course, they are the future. So Hippocrates said the root of all evil lies in the gut. And um, he said something about everything, I think. But anyway, 2000 years after that, we are beginning to think that he's right. And that it's actually intimately involved in human physiology. Uh, the ratio of human cells to microbial cells has been, uh, now, recent estimates are 1 to 1 or 1 to 1.3. But nevertheless, although they have been down-regulated, it means that all of us are born humans, but we actually live our life as an organism consisting of more microbial cells than human cells. And that is sort of, um, when, when I got... When you sort of take that in, it's quite, uh, it quite changes the view of what a human is, I think. Uh, it has, the microbiota has a collective gene set that is larger than the set of human genes, approximately 300 times larger, it's been said. So this means that um, there are more microbial cells um, producing enzymes, producing products that are affecting our physiology than the human cells. And they uh, also have been shown to influence gene expression in a variety of organs. So they actually go to our human colonic cells and change the expression of genes. Are you understanding me? Am I talking too fast? No? Good. Okay. So it really has to be seen, the whole gut microbiota and also the skin microbiota has to be seen as an integral part of a person's mm -hmm functional genetic profile, what ends up being the end of process in, is on, in our bodies. So man and its ancestors have co-evolved with microbes based on mutual benefits. And um, uh, there is a loss of diversity in the Western world. When you, when you look at different Western countries, and um, for instance, Amazon Indians, you can see that they cluster differently. So the correlations are weaker. So, the correlation across African um, tribal uh, populations and South Americans are more close to each other, although they're two continents apart than the South Indian, South American Indians and the, the Western American, um, the North American, sorry. Uh, so there really is something going on in the Western world. And um, we are worried because we know that lack of diversity 
It's only association, you don't know about reversal causation, but actually very, very many non-communicable diseases have been shown to have a loss, um, lack of diversity compared to the healthy population. Uh, most of the time we don't really know what that means and how the whole complexity of this is, is affecting us. But I think one nice example is, um, you know, when you know that one microbe, such as the oxalobacter former genes, which uh, has a substrate oxalic acid, which uh, is something that causes kidney stones uh, in humans. And it's been shown that if you have that microbe, you're, you're probably not going to get kidney stones. It's there in all the hunter-gatherer communities. Every individual has them. They're often there in childhood in the Western population, and then you lose it as you get older. And in the adult population, there is less and less oxalobacter. So it's a very clear example of what you can lose by just losing one of these microbes. And in the Western world, there are estimates that we might have lost as much as half or maybe even more of the diversity that we were supposed to have. So what are the factors involved in change in gut microbiota? Why are we experiencing this lack of diversity. So there are many factors, and these are just some of them. So the hygiene, the processing of food, antibiotics, and then the factor that I'm most interested in which is C-section. So we know that the vertical transfer of microbes is ensured through a normal delivery. So if you think that the humans have um, developed a set of, of commensal microbes that are beneficial, it is transported from one generation to the other through the natural delivery process. And um, it's also um, supported by breastfeeding, uh, which has a lot of oligosaccharides, and that promotes a certain beneficial gut microbiota composition consisting of bifidobacteria. But it's actually crucial for the baby to get these microbes from her mother and it's passed down through the generation. And how important that is, is illustrated by the whale. So water, of course, is a very densely populated with microbes and there the whale baby actually is showered in um, the fecal mass from the mothers whenever it eats. So, and it's anatomically shifts compared to what happened when we went on to land. So I think that is also a nice illustration that it's supposed to be that way. Okay. Um, so I was very interested in looking at, um, yeah, this one first. So this is uh, work done on how uh, is the um, baby's gut microbiota compared to the maternal vagina. And this is in a normal delivery. Whereas this is a C-section delivery, and you can see that this baby has a gut microbiota which looks very similar to the skin of the mother, whereas this baby has a gut microbiota similar to the vagina. And also, in a, and this is work done by Dominique Bello, and she has a number of babies here that are correlated or clustered based on the correlation across the different gut microbiota. And you see the same, you see this very distinct clustering of uh, infant gut microbiota with the maternal skin, which is not supposed to be when they are C-section delivered. So does it matter then who are there in our gut, whether it's skin microbiota from the mother or from the vagina? So I think this slide is uh, very interesting where you see, or we need to be to remember this, and I keep forgetting it at least, that you know, a nematode and a human share nearly 40% of genes which is amazing. And uh, E. coli and bacteroides, they, these are both very common microbes in our gut, and they share approximately the same. So it means they also differ with 60%. So it probably does matter who are there. So I was interested in looking at C-section delivery and food allergy, thinking of C-section as sort of an indirect exposure markers of a disruptive gut. And uh, I used open and double blind placebo controlled food challenges um, and the Oslo Bird cohort with 2,800 kids. And uh, what you see here is that um, in infants of non allergic mother, there's a low baseline incidence of food allergy. And if the mother is allergic, you see there is an increased baseline that the infant gets food allergy, but it's threefold higher if the baby is delivered by a C section compared to an, a vaginal delivery. 
And these papers are published and we also adjusted for a lot of confounding factors because obviously there are factors tied to be, being C-section uh, infant um, compared to vaginal delivery. And then I, uh, I also repeated it uh, using two different outcomes, apparently reported food reactions, because the, they have different biases. So one has selection bias and the other one has misclassification bias. And the results were very similar, so that also strengthened the results. And then I repeated them in the MOBA study, and this has not yet been published. So I looked at 35,000 kids, so of course we didn't do any challenges in them, so we used apparently reported milk or egg reactions, um, and it had to be twice reported in order to be um, a higher, we know that it's, it's a larger risk, a larger chance that it's actually confirmed if the parents are repeated uh, repeatedly, reported repeatedly, sorry. So what you see here again is that in non-allergic mothers, it, the infants don't have much food allergy and it doesn't really matter whether it's a C-section or a vaginal delivery. Whereas if um, the mother is allergic, you have a higher baseline, it increases with antibiotics. So we looked at that as well and it increases with C-section. Uh, so you may say, how can a single event have such a large effect? Because okay, they're born differently, they get the skin microbiome, but sooner or later they're probably going to pick up the microbes that are good for them, right? And, and evolve in a similar trajectory. And they actually do. The more time, as time goes by, uh, they, are, they get closer to each other and you can't really see that much differences in C-section delivered children and vaginal delivered children. But I think there are several reasons for this and one is that uh, infant gut microbiota is also a determinant of adult gut, uh, gut microbiota because once the microbes are there, they set in motion cascading effects that are predictors of who comes next. Um, so, but the most important thing is the early programming. And there are uh, many developmental windows now identified in animal experiments uh, where the outcome depend on microbial input in a certain period in early life. Um, and they have identified these windows using germ-free animals. And one of the first that was identified was a critical window for the immune system. And here are the pictures of Peyer's plaques, which are, to say it very simply, these are immune factories in the gut. They produce uh, immune cells like B cells and um, um, in the germ-free animal, um, this is, the pyrus plaque, these factories are much smaller and they're not active. So you can see they're very dense. In um, a normal conventional animal, you can see that the pyrus plaque is much larger and, and it has this clearance in the middle, which indicates that it's actively producing. Uh, cells. And um, the important thing was that uh, when these germ-free animals were exposed to microbes, they quickly catched up, very, very quickly, and they became identical to the conventional uh, animals. But if the animal was too old before it got the microbial input, nothing happened. So it, it was frozen in this uh, situation for the rest of its life with an underdeveloped uh, Peyer's plaque with less circulating B and T cells. So this was published already in 1997, and, I, I, and it's a very strong study, and it's been replicated. But I don't think people really understood the implications of this, because it didn't get as much attention as it deserved. What we know now is that there are similar, similar critical windows also for uh, narrow behavior. So you can see that animals uh, if they're not uh, exposed to microbes within a certain time frame, they have an aberrant uh, reaction to stress, which um, also can be tied to um, depression. So they, they look at swim tests, how long the animals are able to swim around before they just give up. And that's supposed to be an equivalent to depression in, in humans. And really interesting associations, but all indicating that there is this early critical window where you need to be exposed to microbes. It's also been shown for the capillary network of the gut and for metabolic programming. 
So this is a very cool study, I think. It's an animal experiment on two mice strains with two different genetic characteristics. So one strain has, is explorative, and one is very anxious, <coughs> anxious even for a mice to be. <clears throat> and what they did is they changed these so-called genetic traits in behavior by switching the gut microbiota. So they took, um, they let bulb sea mice get microbiota from the NI Swiss mice, from the mothers, to the babies while they were still um, germ-free. And they saw that the bulb mice then increased its exploratory behavior and the hippocampal levels of BDNF and vice versa. So uh, I think this brings, to, brings the question up, are there other genetic traits or so-called traits that we think of as genetics that might actually be uh, conferred by our gut microbiota? So this is also a very cool study. I don't know how many of have, you have heard about the studies on toxoplasmosa. Mm -hmm. So this, yeah, <laughs> so this is a parasite and it needs the cat as its primary host for, to complete the circle. And it's been shown that when a rat uh, gets infected by toxoplasmosa, it loses its, um, uh, what do you say? It's, um, it's not afraid of cats anymore. Actually, it's attracted to cat urine. So it's still afraid of dogs, but not of cats. And they've done, done studies showing that um, even if they erase toxoplasmosa from the, the rat, so it's no longer in the rat, they have permanently altered the brain, uh, it seems, so that the rat has these traits. And I mean, you know, a thousand neurosurgeons wouldn't be able to dislocate that trait in your brain. So. I think we need to, to really acknowledge that, that the microbial world and the parasites are able to affect our behavior, and that's quite a new thing, too, to, to open up for. So this is also a very cool study, one of my favorites, where they used um, twins that were discordant for weight. So they, they used both um, monozygotic, so identical twins, as well as uh, twins with a shared uterus. And they transferred uh, fecal mass from the twins into mice and what they saw was that the unlucky mice got fat and the lucky mice stayed lean. Uh, and they had in this, by this study design, of course, they had control for genetics. So it's a very neat study design. Moreover, they saw that um, if they co-host the mice, because the mice go and they, they eat their other's uh, fecal masses, so they share the bacteria. And if they co-host mice, this prevented obesity development in the unlucky mice. But if they gave the mice a crappy western diet, it did not protect the unlucky mice from getting obese. But the lean mice didn't get obese on a crappy diet. So it's a beautiful study, sort of uh, integrating all the factors we, we think are important, right? The diet and gut microbiota and, and also, of course, there are genes. So I hope you are there <laughs> and agree that this is quite interesting and we should check out some stool samples. This is, um, I'm going to present to you now the human genomic study. So like Mark said, it's a cohort study of 2,000 mother-child pairs. Uh, 2,400 have milk samples, wherein 1,300 have toxicants analyzed so far. And then I have this subset of 546 uh, infants who have gut microbiota mapped, and there's an overlap. And the aims of the nomic study, of course, is to study the determinants of gut microbiota and effect on health, and look at interactions with environmental toxicants and nutrients. So this is um, the data collection. So we have fecal samples at numerous time points, one in four days, one in four months, six months, one year, two years, and we're now doing the follow-up. We have 120 kids where we sampled fecal samples, but also blood and urine, hair and spit, and doing a clinical examination. Uh, from the mothers, we have uh, also blood and urine through an overlap with the MOBA study. On our own, within our cohort, we have one fecal sample from the mother and milk from the um, mother. And we have lots of information from the medical literature, industry, pregnancy journals, questionnaires at different time points. And we have the Norwegian patient register linked in now. So these are the uh, data that are there so far. We've analyzed 
uh, the gut microbiota using a Lumina technique that identifies the microbes by identifying a short part of the DNA sequence. We have 22 probes that are specific for specific microbes and microbial groups. Uh, we have toxicants, we have the fecal metabolomics, so we've analyzed what's in the, in the fecal mass apart from uh, microbes. We have probes for candida, and we have the short-chain fatty acids and all the microbial functions. And then we relate it to different outcomes. So what I'm going to show you today is just um, some results based on Illumina, the probes, and some of the toxicants. So looking at the Illumina data, what we saw was that um, these are the four common families in the human gut. And the microbial kingdom is really rich, but all studies show that it's only these four families that are, act that are actually there in, in the human gut. So they're strongly selected. We see that in the beginning, all of them are there, but progressing towards two years, femur cutis is really increasing but there's still also quite a fair amount of actinobacteria where the beefeater bacterium are. You can see that the protobacterium where many of the opportunistic uh, low pathogens are really diminishes, so it's not much left here. And the interesting thing, of course, is look how closely um, similar the child is to the mother at two years. So not in the beginning, but seems like the seeds are there, and at some point it evolves into the, the adult gut microbiota type. So the first thing we wanted to do, because studies were coming and they were saying, this is how the gut microbiota look at in infants, but they were C-section babies, had antibiotics, all kinds of things. So you can't really say this is how it's supposed to look like. So what we did is we chose infants that were all vaginally delivered, all at term, they were all breastfed exclusively for at least the first month, and they had to be partially breastfed up to four months. They had no transfer to the intensive units, and even more important, no antibiotics to the infant at any time point during this period, nor to the mother as long as she was breastfeeding, nor one month before delivery. And we might actually have increased that um, interval if we had known what we do now now, because actually antibiotics, even earlier in pregnancy, has an effect on the infant, uh, on, on the risk in the child. Um, so the first surprising result was that only 25 of the, 25% 25 of these infants satisfied those criteria. So it was, you know, that was really surprising. We are really, uh, uh, putting medical interventions uh, and doing things with our newborns that uh, affect their gut microbiota. So what we also saw was that the most common microbe actually was the Staphylococcus, and that is considered to be an uh, opportunistic microbe. And you can see that from uh, four days, which is uh, the filled circles, to the open circles, which are four months, you can see that there's a decline in, in Staphylococcus, which probably indicate that it's being kicked out when more appropriate microbes are coming in. And then you see that E. coli is uh, there to 60% of the infants, and it increases. And it's probably supposed to be there because uh, we do have culture. Inform so we have information from a whole century back on microbes that we can culture. We just don't know the rest of the microbiota. And we know that all infants were colonized nearly immediately after birth uh, 100 years ago. All were colonized with, uh, with E. coli in the middle of the uh, last century. In Sweden, they have some uh, studies going over time where they showed 75% had E. coli during the first week in 1980, 50%. 10 years later, and among C-section deliveries, there is only 10%. So this is a marked change in, in the microbes. We don't know what it means, but we know that E. coli really was there in all infants 100 years ago and not anymore. And that it, even in these very selected children that, that hadn't been exposed to any medical intervention, you still only see it in 60%. And this is a heat map, and uh, each uh, column is a baby, and each microbial probe has a row. So what you see here is that uh, in the babies that have 
um, a high amount of opportunistic microbes, there are less bifida bacteria, whereas when you have a lot of bifida bacteria, you have less of the opportunistic ones. We also tried to see if these clusters were clustering the same four months later, but they were not. Okay, so going back to obesity, I've shown you that there are some nice studies out there really indicating that gut microbiota has plays a role for obesity. We also know that genes plays a role, but it's a very small uh, role. Uh, we know that the Boston cream pie cake or <laughs> other diets <laughs> also play a role. And uh, there are more and more attention paid to the fact that chemicals may be uh, disrupting our, our metabolism and causing obesity. So now I want to talk a little bit about persistent environmental toxicants. And uh, just for the ones of you who don't know about them, they're secreted into milk. And I'm especially concerned about the persistent ones because those are the ones that reach high levels in humans. And that is both due to uh, humans being quite old when we get our first child, so 30 years. So we've accumulated it for a longer time. But it's also because we are on the top of the food chain and these toxicants are biomagnified over the different uh, steps in the food chain. Um, so as I said, there are high concentrations in human milk, much higher than in other food, unfortunately, but it's a fact. And uh, also the high fat content of milk means that there are higher levels there because most of these persistent toxicants are, fat, are lipophilic, but not all, there are also some protein bound. And when the mother gets pregnant and when she breastfeeds, her levels reflect both the current and earlier exposure. And there are many chemicals belonging to this group. So this is just two of them, PCBs and dioxins, some of the more toxic ones. Uh, and here it shows that even in the Fiji, in the remote island, uh, you can find these toxicants in milk. And Egypt seems to be particularly high. You can also see that this is um, yeah, measured. We're looking at the activation of the dioxin, the AH receptor, which is involved in cancer risk. And you can see that different countries have a different pattern. So for instance, the Slovakian Republic, it's PCBs that contribute more than, yeah, PCBs in yellow contribute more than the dioxins. So there are different patterns across countries and there are different levels, but they're found everywhere. And this is from the third round of the WHO initiated studies on milks. So they do these surveys every five years and they compare the levels across different countries. I didn't find any in Canada though. So uh, two years ago there was a WHO UN report um, that concluded that synthetic chemicals have serious health implications and has become a global threat. And they did the summary 10 years before where they said there wasn't really much evidence and now they said uh, we it's been proven or suspected behind many of the diseases we see increasing in the Western world that chemicals play a role. And these are especially diseases of the endocrine system such as diabetes, thyroid disease, obesity, infertility, and breast and prostate cancer. So what mechanisms can chemicals uh, work through? Um, they may, this is only one mechanism where they may affect the nuclear receptors such as PPR and RxR receptors and this is a mechanism that has been proposed for organotins and BPA and dioxin which are two such chemicals. Uh, organotins were used to coat the boats against growth on the underside of the boats and they were shown to have hormonal effects on the, on the snails in the sea so that's why they were phased out to, to some degree. Um, they have been um, extensively examined in experimental studies and uh, studies show that uh, when stem cells are exposed to organotins, they actually are prone to develop into fat cells on behalf of other cells. And uh, it, they also show um, changes in different organs. So for instance, the liver has structural changes and steatosis. Uh, so um, I think this is particularly interesting and that's why I'm showing it here because it's a mechanism that is relevant for humans. Many times we don't know if the mechanisms we show in animals actually can also happen in humans because we're different. But um, this is the mechanism, these nuclear receptors that are targeted actually when you treat diabetes. 
And it's also known that when you do that, uh, weight increase is, um, is a common uh, side effect. So I think that is interesting. So this is a business slide from the report. And the point is that there are many other mechanisms that can play, that whereby the chemicals can play their role. And you can look that up in the report. But I also wanted to point to the toxicants that are, or all the chemicals that are measured here. And actually I looked through them. And then I looked at, in my human milk samples from Norway. And all these chemicals are in human milk, which is quite disturbing, really. I haven't shown them all here because that would be too busy, but the only exception actually are organotins where we, we find them, but in very few babies. So we measure them in 200 Norwegian milk samples and we identify them only in three babies. And also, of course, nicotine, where the mother actually has to smoke or be passively exposed. But otherwise, they're there. And um, yeah, the other point is that the youngest are the highest exposed within the population. This is a study on brominated flame retardants that you might have heard about. And you can see that um, the um, uh, highest levels are found in the children from zero to four years. And if you had grouped that into zero to two, it would have been even higher in the very youngest. You see that later on, they're pretty constant and fe female and male are the same, have the same levels. When they pass 25, you can see that females have lower levels than the male. And this is also shown for the older generation. And this is because of breastfeeding, that the, the mother transfers toxicants into the baby, so she has lower levels. So this um, transfer through breastfeeding is very important and has not been correctly assessed in many of the studies out there on toxicants. So I want to show you a paper from Werner, uh, Mark, um, who's here, where you see that um, duration of breastfeeding is really determines postnatal exposure. And you see in the first situation or scenario, the baby is not breastfed. The blue line is the child's blood level. The gray is the mother. At birth, they are the same because there is a homostasis across um, the mother and the child at birth. But you see due to uh, dilution, due to growth of the baby, the baby grows bigger. So it dilutes the concentration and the concentration goes down and the baby triples its weight during the first year. So it's a huge expansion of the fat mass volume and you see this reflected in really the levels going down to nearly nothing. This is different if the child is breastfed for four months you can see the levels increases in the child, but then when cessation of breastfeeding, you have the same dilution and they end up having approximately the same levels, the mother and the child. Whereas for 12 months of breastfeeding, it's quite dramatic. You see a five-fold increase in the levels in the child, and you see you know, this huge uh, area under the curve represents the, the exposure to the child. And so that's one point, the effect of breastfeeding, but also look at the misclassification. If you do, as many have done, you take one maternal serum concentration data point. So here it would be 50, whether you took maternal serum or you took cord blood is 50. And you're saying, okay, if you have 50 at this time point, what are the effects on cognition at four years or six years or obesity? What you're actually doing are you're grouping all these three kids together and you can see that they're exposure mass is vastly different and there's it's actually a surprise that you can find anything at all in the in the results that have been reported of course this only holds true if you have a long breastfeeding duration if it's from a country where there's very short breastfeeding duration or everyone breastfeed approximately the same it won't be such a big misclassification but still this is a point that that we need to address and think of when we review the literature that is out there and not the least, we need to do a better job. And then we can use either Werner's model, and there are several models out there also. Another one for, from our group, which is uh, less pharmacokinetically based, so a little bit easier to apply. But the main point is, think of this and, and use a model. Um, so this is a result from my postdoc, Nina Isat. And what we did here, we wanted to disentangle the effect of prenatal and postnatal exposure, because 
Um, there are many studies out there claiming that prenatal effect is the one that has effect and you don't see anything later. But then you really need to do a better job on, on it, on trying to disentangle it. So we used uh, Mark's model in this um, study and we <clears throat> saw that um, DDT, if you looked at the total area under a curve, not distinguishing whether it happened in the prenatal period or the postnatal period, you saw that there was an effect of DDE on rapid early infant growth, which is, which is a risk factor for later obesity. And you see that um, if you looked at only prenatal or only postnatal, it seemed to be the prenatal that was driving it. And when you adjusted for postnatal, the eff effect estimates is, is even clearer that um, it seems like it's going on in the prenatal period. And um, we had issues of collinearity, but we managed to solve them. And um, I think this is also very important because this has public health implications, right? So you want to know um, what happens before birth. You can't do much about. Um, it takes a long, long time to get the levels down in the population. But you need to know if there are separate effects based on what uh, exposure in the breastfeeding period is, right? So this is also something we need to do a better job on. Uh, and uh, yeah, the results, results are shown for an interquartile range and corresponds to weighing 250 gram more. So it's, it's quite an effect. For PCB, we saw the opposite effect uh, and not so clear. So the last thing I wanted to tap into is that there may be interactions between diet, gut microbiota, toxicants, and the host, and they are two ways for all of these factors, so it, it gets pretty complicated, but especially uh, the way that gut microbiota may affect the fate of toxicants is really important and really uh, being pub you know, published. We see that now that um, gut microbiota also affects the fate of the nutrients we have, um, we take in and are involved in cardiovascular disease to a very large extent. and. Um, we see that they metabolize the medicine that we are using, prescription medicine that we are using. And uh, there are not that many studies out there on how it affects toxicants, but it does, um, uh, there is one study on BPA showing an interaction between uh, gut microbiota and, and BPA. So this is an important area. There are many ways by which Toxicants can affect, um, no, gut microbiota, sorry, can affect um, toxicants. So it can be through pre systemic metabolism, uh, competition for liver detoxification, enteropathic circulation, and ad adsorption. So it's, I can't go into that, but that's another area where we need to tap into because obviously our infants are under double attack, but these two environmental exposure may also interact. And to get the full picture, we need to think about, we need to tap into this as well. Um, and toxicants may affect gut microbiota. We're looking at that now, and it seems to be also going that way. So take home messages. Um, early life is a very critical period in human development, and there's been a lot of focus on the intrauterine period, but also the period right after Bird is very important because that's when the massive exposure to microbes usually take place. Uh, alterations may have long-lasting effects. According to experimental studies, children in the Western world are under double attack. Uh, decrease in diversity of gut microbiota, commensal microbes disappearing. And I want especially, I would be happy if you remember the important role of bird process uh, in transferring the gut microbiota from one generation to another, and the milk composition with its oligosaccharides are important. So the message, you know, it, it's complicated. You don't want mothers not to breastfeed, but you may not want them to breastfeed too long because of the transfer of toxicants. Uh, there's an exposure to an ever-increasing amount of chemicals. Infants are the highest exposed. Correct exposure model is important to apply and interactions also needs to be addressed. So I think that future treatments, um, you know, the, in, the Bedouins are using fecal, camel transplants when they have diarrhea. And they actually teach this mechanism of survival to the Germans under the Second World War because it's important. 
you don't survive in the, de in the desert. And I think the future are going to have more and more of, um, I mean, transplants are already used, but of course uh, we can all hope for more sophisticated uh, corrections of our gut microbiota. So that was my final note.